right here. Uh, so welcome. Uh, my name is Edmund, uh, Edmund Trung from Dot Asia. And this is a session about, um, we, as I mentioned earlier a little bit, uh, this is, we, we're starting with what Dot Asia launched as a youth mobility index. But the, uh, the, the, the intent of the, the, this particular session is hopefully we can uh, get into a, a more interactive discussion. Uh, we have some panelists here. I won't go through uh, introducing them, but I'll, I'll start with a little bit of an introduction of uh, what what we've been doing. I'll, I'll start with ourselves first, I guess. Uh, Dot Asia ourselves is a uh, is of course run the top level domain for Dot Asia, uh, but we actually organize as a uh, we run as a nonprofit organization and a, a very big. I, I can't control the thing. Uh, okay, so, um, and a big, big part of my, uh, our uh, work is actually supporting internet development around Asia. And in the last uh, many years, actually, uh, since we launched in 2007 and 2008, we have been supporting uh, a, a series of uh, projects to, for especially for youth engagement and development uh, around Asia. And uh, we started actually a, an initiative called NetMission.Asia, uh, you can check it out, um, that started to, to bring young people to, to this particular forum, uh, the Internet Governance Forum. And um, uh, we, we, we like to think that we helped inspire uh, a lot more uh, programs that bring young people to uh, the IGF, to ICANN, to other Internet Governance Forums around the world. And, Earlier this year, we launched uh, what we call the Youth Mobility Index, and what it does is that it, it tries to build on some of the work that, that we have been um, doing in the last little while, uh, supporting young people, but also looking at what, ac at what actually um, helps uh, 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 young people not only just get online, but actually leverage uh, uh, online resources and, and what we are calling uh, digital mobility uh, to, oops, sorry, this one, uh, using, uh, enhancing what we call digital mobility of young people. Uh, and here's kind of a, 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 what we condense the effort into uh, a, a kind of, uh, I, I guess, our, our vision, which is to support young, uh, young Asians setting out to, to change the world. Uh, we believe that the, the internet has that, that potential. We believe that, however, we also believe that beyond the internet, there are many things that, that affect uh, mobility uh, online. That, uh, 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 there are many things that affect youth mobility, uh, not just online, but actually also offline as well. And both of them together uh, forms a, uh, a, a, an important part of the, uh, what we are calling the Youth Mobility Index. Um, so early last year, we, we engaged with a number of uh, academia uh, professors, and, and including uh, Chitat Chan, who, who is actually joining us from, from Hong Kong remotely today in the session, uh, Dr. Shanti Robertson from, from, from uh, Western Sydney University. Um, Shanti is actually in Melbourne, and I'm joining her tomorrow. Uh, in, in, in a conference in Melbourne, so I'm flying over there tonight, um, uh, talking about the Youth Mobility Index as well. Uh, so, so she won't be able to join us today. And some of you might know uh, Malavika, uh, who has been involved in, in, in a lot of the uh, internet governance uh, discussion in Asia as well. So uh, with their help, actually, a, a framework was put together uh, as a uh, as a measure, really, uh, about what, what we call uh, youth mobility, or uh, more importantly, a big part of it is what we call the internet factor here in, in, the, in, the, in the methodology, but it's really trying to uh, look at what we call digital mobility. Uh, and the way we think about digital mobility is how young people are able to uh, not only just move around the internet, but also to mobilize uh, resources and mobilize people uh, online. So the, the basic structure is uh, looks at um, some geographic mobility, and you look at outbound and inbound mobility, uh, and also a component of um, uh, social mobility, what was usually conventionally called start, uh, uh, upwards mobility. Uh, and then we also, a, a big part of it, as I mentioned, is what we call the internet factor, which is the uh, uh, digital mobility por portion of it. 
Uh, we look at three different areas, which are, I guess, uh, most most you know uh, most important for young people. One of the starting point of the the study actually uh, identified that employment or the worries of employment, um, especially as it is being challenged by by AI and you know all those ki different future of work uh, issues, uh, is the top concern of, of 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 young people around Asia and in fact actually around the world. Um, so employment, from, from employment, we expand a little bit. The, the feeder to employment is education. Of course, that's a big uh, question for, for, for young people. And an alternative, really, to, to employment is entrepreneurship. So these are three um, kind of uh, sec sectors that, that we look at uh, as core sectors that, that form the, the YMI uh, framework. So. Um, so a little bit of highlights, it, it, it actually uses, um, the, the methodology itself uses what, what is called, I guess, secondary data. We use public data sets that are uh, collected from, uh, uh, collected by various uh, governments and, and agencies. Uh, so, so we're drawing on UNESCO, uh, World Bank, and uh, uh, other UNICEF uh, uh, data sets. Um, but it's actually combining, uh, combining about uh, 216 different uh, social and economic indicators as well as uh, technical indicators. What we have thrown in uh, more interestingly is like um, not just the access uh, number of uh, users online, but actually, for example, IPv4 addresses used, IPv6 addresses used participation at here, you know, at the, the IGF, participation at ICANN, and those types of uh, uh, statistics into, into, the, uh, into the aggregate uh, data. So that's um, another important part that, that we've incorporated is that it's uh, youth-driven. Uh, An important concept of it is that um, besides, for example, uh, besides uh, um, quality of living, the, the traditional quality of living, for uh, a lot of uh, uh, areas um, is focused on the, the housing, the, uh, the, the, the health, um, the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the traffic and those kind of things. But uh, for young people, there, are, there, there could be other uh, considerations and that the, the, um, the weight of, for example, medical care might be slightly lower than uh, ability to travel every, uh, other places, and that is being adjusted in, in terms of how we use part of the indicators to, to come up with the, uh, the final scores. So uh, ultimately, this is, this is a, uh, what we, we launched it this year, uh, and it's a ranking system, actually, ultimately uh, over the, the, the different indicators they come up to a final uh, score, and it's ranked, and with the first year, this year, we have uh, ranked uh, 20 localities around Asia, um, and here's one, one of the, the examples. Um, I won't go into the really details, but uh, what, what gets generated is a, a number of, from the indicators, a number of uh, 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 specific data about the outbound, uh, for example, number of students that are going outbound, number of students coming in, and you know the uh, uh, pe people, that, uh, students are utilizing um, MOOCs, uh, uh, what is called the Mass um, Open Online Courses, um, and. Uh, that's the internet factor and, and some other uh, aspects. So uh, that's for education, for employment, for example, we look at the outbound migrant, uh, inbound migrant, and the youth component of those uh, migrant uh, workers uh, and, and how that impacts the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the whole, whole, whole index. Uh, of course, the wages and, and stuff. And then, uh, as mentioned, the, the IPV, uh, IPv4, IPv6 usage, the domain name uh, usage, they're all part of the, the, um, the, the, the kind of methodology. I won't go into details. If you're interested, I'm happy to, to, to take questions. But, um, but the, the, I, I guess uh, what is interesting for us, at least for the first year, is to see that the, the methodology seems to be holding up uh, reasonably OK. Uh, it correlates quite well with uh, the traditional way to, to think about how uh, an economy or, uh, or jurisdiction is doing. Uh, it correlates well with GDP uh, per, per capita. It correlates well with the, uh, the, the competitiveness rating uh, and stuff. However, it, what is I more interesting is the, the anomalies, right? I mean, the, the ones that are, are slightly different from, from the other uh, economic indicators. Here you see that uh, whereas uh, uh, like, like 
Japan and, and, and Korea uh, actually shows uh, lower in terms of GDP per capita, it's, it has a much higher uh, kind of digital mobility uh, for young people uh, uh, in those, those regions. And that's something that's, that's rather interesting. So whether, you know, how that actually uh, translates into the future competitiveness of those uh, areas uh, versus simply looking at the GDP and the GDP development uh, would, be, would be an interesting uh, area to, to, to look at. So here's a, I guess, a, a quick note on, on the, this final score. I, I hope it's interesting, but um, that uh, may, may not be the most important part of, of a study, although uh, one, um, it's, it's quite, uh, I guess, uh, it's not too much people's surprise. I mean, Singapore and Hong Kong are way up there, and then uh, followed by Japan and, and Korea, uh, and, and follow on. It's, it's more or less uh, the, the top guys are kind of the, the, the economically better ones off. But then in the middle, it's, it becomes more interesting. You look at Taiwan, Malaysia, and then you see Bhutan there, uh, which is re really kind of interesting uh, to see. I, I won't go into details. It's, it's actually, you, if, um, I think we have a bunch of the reports here, or you can go into uh, YMI.Asia to, to check it out. Um, but, but what I want to draw attention to is the, the other graph on the uh, bottom right. Um, and here's a, a, a look at how migrant, uh, incoming migrant uh, uh, force is, is helping the economy in some sense, and compare it specifically on youth. Uh, here you see, for example, you look at Hong Kong and Singapore, you see a big circle around it, the, um, the, the, the slightly translucent circle. That's the total number of inbound uh, migrants. And inside uh, the more solid color circle, uh, that represents the youth percentage, uh, the per part of youth incoming uh, migrant workers. So you see that while Hong Kong and Singapore has a huge uh, total migrant force coming in, the youth component is very small. But when you look at Japan, that's really interesting. Um, Japan has a, you know, a relatively small incoming uh, workforce, but a big chunk of it is, is youth. Well, clearly, that's, uh, I guess that is part of the, the, the strategic uh, approach for, for the country as well, attracting young people w with their uh, aging, uh, aging kind of uh, uh, population. So these are some of the things that, that we find uh, rather uh, interesting. So um, again, I, I won't go into details. I want to go to a, a more of a discussion uh, shortly. But here is some of the data that, that, that we, we have uh, kind of created into graphs. What is interesting to see is that on the, on the Pentagon um, um, kind of vector diagram, you see that this is the one from Japan. While they are quite high, what you see is that that's the outbound, inbound, startup, sustainability, inter internet factor. You see that J Jap Japan will have a pretty big uh, high score overall. The outbound uh, propensity, if you will, uh, is actually relatively low. So Japanese young people don't want to go out. Um, and whether that will um, affect future uh, competitiveness uh, may be an another issue. So, so these are some of the things that we hope to uh, uh, look at and, and perhaps uh, inform uh, policies. So here is Taiwan is a little bit similar, right? Um, those, so they have a very nice uh, environment there in Taiwan and young people really don't want to go out. Uh, and is that going to, to affect part of the, uh, the future in terms of uh, 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 tolerance and social tolerance and social um, uh, 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 kind of diversity is something to be seen. Um, another th one that, that I wanted to highlight is Vietnam. Vietnam is rather interesting. Part of the, the, the study this year shows that it has a very high startup uh, uh, momentum and, uh, and, 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 and it's actually uh, young people want to start businesses in, in Vietnam. However, the general uh, mobility is relatively low. So part of the, the, the conclusion there is that maybe the regulatory framework for uh, allowing young people to move about uh, needs to be opened up further. That allows uh, young people to thrive uh, in the future. That's um, one of the things. So uh, another interesting thing that, that we identified is, um, and again, focusing on how uh, traditional indicators are used Fo focus for, for youth uh, is the 
uh, happiness index versus cost of living. Um, traditionally, you look at the happiness index, and that's a well-established index, actually. But in our index, we, we incorporated the, those scores, but we divided it by cost of living. What that does is kind of interesting. Um, Singapore and Hong Kong, for example, is usually very high on, on happiness index overall in Asia. Um, however, when you divide it by the cost of living, well, the co that cost of happiness becomes uh, uh, caused it to actually fall to the bottom of the of the scale. So, so they're actually ranked 18th and and, and 20th at the bottom of the scale. Uh, what that how that impacts young people is because well, young younger people usually they, they haven't built up their assets. They haven't they don't have as much money. So their happiness is actually lower than than other places. Uh, because you know that's those are those are areas where as wh while they have a good mobility and good good uh, opportunity and generally uh, can enjoy uh, uh, um, the kind of life, uh, but as young people, it's it's much more difficult because the the cost of living is high. So this is how we have um, interpreted some of the the indicators differently. I'll. Um, I'll skip to some of the, the planned improvements. So w an important part of the, the initiative is we were, we're, we're hoping to improve over time. And these, this session and, and few other sessions that we're, we're trying to organize is also to look at um, how other uh, uh, indicators have been, been being developed, how they are being used, how data is actually can be used to advocate uh, uh, policies. I mentioned the interesting observations in Japan and Taiwan and Vietnam, but how do we turn this into to action uh, is something that, that, that we are uh, hoping to see. And some of the feedback has already pointed out a few direction, and some of the plan inclu improvements include uh, gender. Um, uh, in the first, for this first version, uh, gender uh, equity uh, wasn't included as a big part of the dis uh, 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 calculation. Um, uh, so, so Nick, the, the coming year we're looking at uh, incorporating that more thoroughly. Um, we're also um, uh, there's a, a parallel initiative, I would say, um, that UNESCO started. Um, unfortunately, they have an exact. The, the same time right now that they're having their session here. Originally, we were going to have them come join us, and we were going to join them, but neither could happen because it's happening at the same time. But uh, the uh, uh, Internet Universality Indicators uh, and the Rome Principle, uh, rights, openness, uh, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder approach uh, framework. So what we're looking at is as we were developing the youth mobility uh, framework, actually UNESCO was uh, creating the, the Rome framework and the uh, IUI uh, work. Uh, in the coming year, as they finalize the framework for IUI, uh, actually we will be adopting that into what we call uh, a, a big part of the uh, internet factor or the digital mobility co uh, component of it will be uh, synced up, if you will, with the, uh, with the UNESCO framework and which we have been uh, participating and contributing to as well. Um, so this is one, one big area. The, uh, another uh, one which I think uh, I'll, I'll pass to Chitat in, in a moment to, to work on, uh, to talk about, is um, expanding from uh, the, the Youth Mobility Index some uh, uh, additional, to hopefully to Im inspire additional uh, studies on how some of these uh, indices uh, uh, actually in case studies, uh, more qualitative studies as well as quantitative studies on how, uh, how it's actually impacting uh, young lives. Uh, and so, and then the, oops, I zoomed in instead, I think. All right, uh, another one which um, Sherry here will, will cover a little bit more is uh, we're, we're also looking at incorporating some open data uh, index um, and Sherry from uh, ISOC Hong Kong will, will talk a little bit more about how, how that uh, could be incorporated and th how, how we should think about it uh, in terms of uh, uh, supporting uh, youth development as well. Um, and uh, there's also, uh, we, we, this year we've incorporated part of the uh, Freedom on the Net uh, uh, statistics. We're also uh, reaching out to, to Freedom House uh, and, and trying to work with them on, on improving that, that part of it uh, to, to incorporate other 
uh, aspects. So ultimately, what we, we, we hope to, to really talk about is to, in, in essence, change part of the narrative. Uh, we talk about internet access a lot of times in terms of only uh, providing access or, you know, but, but how do we think about it really supporting young people in, in a sustainable way and supporting the, the economy in a sustainable way. We're trying to change that narrative into uh, what we call digital mobility. Um, we, I I including here at IGF and other forums, we often talk about uh, simply the ability to, to, to get access to the, the connectivity uh, but also, uh, and also like a free open internet, those kind of uh, uh, narrative. What we're thinking about in, in terms of the youth mobility index and what we call digital mobility is hopefully to change that narrative uh, towards a, a what we call digital mobility, which incorporates all those, but uh, talks about how it actually supports development and how it actually supports young people uh, around the world. So that's really the, the introduction of what we've been doing, uh, and at this point, I'll, um, I'll start, I'll, since Chitat is on the remote, I'll, I'll, I'll pass to uh, Chitat first uh, to, to add, uh, and at any point in time, please, uh, we, we're hoping this would be somewhat interactive, so at any point in time, if you want to ask any uh, clarification questions, please uh, just uh, raise your hand a little bit and I will uh, indicate that you want to speak and I, I I'll put you in, in the queue. Um, Chitat, are you able to join us? Um, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Um, um, first of all, thanks for giving me this opportunity to participate in this Youth Mobility Index project. I think it's a very important and very interesting um, uh, project that can contribute to our understanding regarding the situation of the young people in different places. Uh, let me explain a little bit more about uh, the youth mindset in Asia that you mentioned in your presentation. Um, I think this YMI initiative um, can associate with many other initiatives and can inspire many other initiatives. The part about the youth mindset in Asia is that, you know, um, you know, my background is a social science um, a researcher. I'm interested in social phenomenon, and I think um, if we really want to mobilize governments to have some policy change or some real initiative that they will put more resources in those uh, real initiatives. I think we need to show them the real impact on people. You know, we, we have different numbers. We have, um, hey, can you? Oh, something wrong? Disconnected? No, we can still hear you. Uh, probably try without video from your side because um, that that is more that cuts down on the requirement for bandwidth too sorry about the technical problem I think something wrong right no uh, it's good now at this particular point you uh, we can hear you loud and clear again <laughs> I'm sure about that um, but um, something wrong with my screen. Uh, actually, from my computer, I cannot see you. But you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Well, what I want to say is that we need to show governments and um, policymakers the real impact on people. So I think the survey, the youth mindset in Asia, is important in a way that uh, we try to um, use of self-reporting uh, questionnaire to measure some psychological constructs, including close-mindedness, curiosity, self-esteem, uh, ethnocentric tendency. These are the, I mean, these are the psychosocial metrics that we want to measure. 
And if we can have the results of these psychosocial outcomes of different places, of different, from different cultures, and at the same time, if we can have the YMI index and some other in, index, we can, we can further develop, further investigate the correlations uh, between, between these psychosocial outcomes and those uh, quantified uh, social cultural conditions. So in this way, we can have more evidence to show governments and those policymakers in different places the ways in which these so psycho I mean this um, social cultural conditions, technological conditions, um, um, in the way that we can show them in what ways these conditions are related or not related to those psychosocial outcomes uh, of young people in different places. So I do think that um, um, YMI and other index have established something very important, some important quantified foundation, quantified metrics for us to compare and correlate them with those psychosocial outcomes. So I do think that this is something, uh, this is a very important initiative that can help um, um, social science research. Thank you, Jita. Um, I, I, I was just informed by my, uh, sorry, I'm not very, Watagi. 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 Sorry, I can't uh, pronounce your name properly. Um, uh, it was, you, you just mentioned that, that she needs to, to leave soon um, because of some emergency, but um, why, why don't I pass it to you and, and perhaps you can introduce a little bit about digital grassroots and, uh, and your views on, on, on uh, how data is supporting uh, 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 these kind of work as well. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Watagi Ndungu and um, I'm the Vice President of Digital Grassroots. We are a youth initiative um, that tries to get more youth online and involved in the policy arena in tech policy. Uh, we are currently in 36 countries and you, we all met last year um, at the IGF in Switzerland. We are 100% youth led, we are all tw under 25 years old and we work with youth in the local communities. We have a booth, um, you can come uh, visit our booth and see how we are actually using data right now at the booth to tell people about our work. So um, I learned how to, I have been working with a lot of data uh, for a long time, but I never really knew how to really use it in my advocacy work. So I decided to, you know, attend a, a, a training by an organization that's based uh, in Uganda called Policy. So we, that's how I learned how to use data-driven advocacy. We use data in all our work, all our work. Even before I, you know, I joined the tech world, I was working for uh, Amnesty International and we were using um, uh, a lot of data um, to do our work. Data-driven advocacy um, is important because you can tell stories using your data. And um, a nice visual visualization of data can get people more interested in the work you do. So a recent campaign that we are currently still running at the IGF, you, you can sign it. Uh, we are collecting signatures on a youth petition to get more youth at the table in internet governance discussions. So um, another way that we have um, used our data um, is, uh, is in Kenya. In Kenya, we are currently trying to pass our data protection bill, and we needed um, to be heard by the legislators. So we went to the local communities um, and asked them uh, questions. Uh, would you vote for this uh, person if they pass this kind of law? Do you understand this kind of law? So we collected all this information and put it, um, and you know, put it, of course, you know, in a nice Excel sheet, and then visualize the data. And you know, we took that information to the legislators, and we were like, you see, this is what the people on the ground are saying. And um, we could tell that they were, um, you know, moved by the data because they invited us again to 
uh, they were like, if these are the numbers, this, you know, it's unacceptable. So we want um, to have, you know, a sitting with you and you can tell us what is wrong with this bill. How do we improve it? Can we work with you, you know, so you can uh, tell us more about how to uh, uh, improve on this uh, and uh, work with us on this. So we have also launched our Digital Rights in Africa report. It's on our booth. You can come and um, have a look at it and see how we have we are using our data to inform people about digital rights uh, in their various uh, regions and in, uh, for us our focus area in the report is Africa. So I believe data-driven advocacy is important, of course, if, you, if used well and, you know, you take care of all aspects, you know, uh, of privacy and security. Um, currently, uh, at Digital Grassroots, we, we have been running various trainings. So we had a French, an English cohort and a French cohort. So of course we have to write, you know, outcome reports and we created uh, a communique where we have used uh, data to explain to even, you know, a five-year-old or a ten-year-old that uh, using, you know, simple data. This is what happens in, uh, when you get online and how you should behave when you get online. So if you'd like to also have a look at our communique, you can come uh, uh, see it at our booth, so you can see how we are using data to change um, to change the policy arena. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, I must apologize to you. I have to go and moderate a session. I learned my colleague lost her travel documents. Thank you. But before you go, can I maybe ask you what, just one question? Is uh, you, you mentioned that the this it seems like the campaign-based uh, specific data collection is very useful for, for kind of advocacy or even activism. Uh, what about these more, um, you know, annual indices and, and, and these kind of data? What, how can we, I guess, improve to support uh, uh, work that is done kind of on the ground is something that, that is interesting. Um, thank you. For, that's a good question. So what we can do is definitely give people the knowledge. People have copious amounts of data and they don't know what to do with it. I am a victim of that. We just collect data, uh, you know, without a goal. You need to know why are you collecting this data. So we have, uh, we are always collecting data. You attend a conference such as this and you ask people some questions and you record it and, you know, you write a report and send it to your boss, but then you don't do anything with it. So you d we need to have, uh, you know, trainings and creating awareness and teach people what do you do with the data you are collecting, why are you collecting the data? And uh, I believe uh, uh, trainings uh, to teach people how to work with data and what to do with data would be very useful, um, you know, to help them learn what now to, how, how to achieve the best advocacy results when using data. Thank you, and I, I won't keep you here. I know that you need to run to another session. Um, but uh, how, like, I just want to see if there is any question um, from, from the floor that, that would like to address. If not, I will let you go. <laughs> thank like you. That. No, thank you for, for dropping by, and sorry. Um, and, but but I guess co coming back to uh, the discussion, uh, what, what we really want to, to, to talk about is how this uh, relates to, to, to advocacy work, but also how it impacts uh, young people, I guess. And so next, I guess next up, we, we're trying to um, get a couple of, uh, I'll, I'll go to Faith and, and Angel first and perhaps talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, uh, your thoughts on some of the, the work that, that was uh, presented in terms of the youth, youth mobility, how you, uh, how much you view uh, mobility uh, as, as an important factor uh, and perhaps, you know, your, your views on, on, on whether these, this type of data is useful at all or, or it's just um, too much, uh, too dense to, 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 uh, to digest. Um, Faith or Angel wants to... So, hello, my name is Angel and I'm one of the representatives of the HKYIGF and I'm currently a year one student in university. So uh, maybe I'll discuss the youth mobility in terms of education. 
Um, in places with a higher year of mobility, um, young people have more opportunities to have access to a more internationalized education. For example, there are programs which a university cooperate with other universities. And um, for example, in the University of Hong Kong, there is a dual program which students can attend one year of education in the London Law School and then have their remaining years at the University of Hong Kong. And then there is also where the internet can help in raising the mobility in education. For example, in the University of Science and Technology, there's the global business course where students will have video classes with a university in US. So because um, education is an important tool that instills different knowledge, values and mindsets that shape what we will become in the future, it is important for us to know more about how education is like and the culture and backgrounds are like in other countries. And this is especially important in the current society because with the advancements of technology, there's rapid globalization and different parts of the world are being becoming more closely connected together. So it is important when youths know more about what is going on in other parts of the world instead of just focusing on their small circle of society. And then um, when, with the help of the internet, there are more people who have the opportunity to get access to an internationalized education because they don't have to travel to another place to have access to the education of another country. So this can also eliminate disparity in a way that um, there are some anti-globalization movements because um, some poorer countries and poorer people actually are being deprived of their opportunities because the richer people can have more access to different resources because they have more capital. So um, with the help of internet, more people will be able to get access to different parts of the world and connect with more people in the world to, um, and in the future they may, may have a, a higher awareness of the global citizenship and be able to even mitigate the disparity problem. So this is why I think the youth mobility is very important because as the cliche goes, um, youths are the future of the society and indeed we are and we also hope to have more a higher mobility so that we can connect with more people and know more about different parts of the world and help people in different parts of the world. Thank you, Angel. Well, what you brought out is kind of interesting. One, one item that you mentioned in terms of uh, as th through education, through the internet, you can connect around the world and know about things. Um, Cheetah, hopefully you're still on and, and be able to, to connect back. One of the things that we also see is that the internet has a different effect as well, or a reverse or an opposite kind of effect. It creates echo chambers. You think you know more, but actually you're knowing less. Um, so, so, you know, how, how do you see about, um, you know, that, that problem uh, of the internet and perhaps Cheetah, if you can uh, uh, add to that as well. Angel first and then. Okay. So, indeed in the internet there's some things like fake news and stuff and it is indeed difficult to distinguish which information is real and which is fake. So, well, it largely depends on our awareness, the awareness of the internet users, and as well as the help of different organizations in maintaining a healthy and a positive internet environment so that internet users can be able to get access to the real and updated information. Chitad, are you able to join and? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Any thoughts about the top? The problem is that lecture, I cannot see anything. <laughs> but okay, I I hear you clearly. You talk about the internet and talk about some um, some uh, phenomenon like echo chamber, right? I think and we. I guess how, how it relates to some of the work that we're doing together in terms of uh, open mindedness uh, among young yes. people. Yes. So that's why I think we need more uh, um, data, 
more experts to talk about to further investigate into this phenomenon because there's not just one single factor determining um, uh, the so-called open-mindedness or closed-mindedness or critical thinking or curiosity. The more data we can have, the more possible that we can identify those, mo those most relevant factors related to um, those psychosocial uh, outcomes of young people in different regions. The echo chamber, uh, echo chamber uh, effect that you mentioned, there's also some other societal uh, factors that are related to the open-mindedness of the people in a particular region, like what you mentioned, inbound mobility, outbound mobility. So the internet circulation, internet access is just one of the items. Um, information, information sources uh, on the internet is just one of the aspects. There are also other societal aspects that are covered by YMI, like uh, how easy that people in the place can go outside and how easy uh, people in the place can have opportunities to get in touch with people from different cultures in their workforce. So I do think that um, the YMI index, if you see this as just an aggregate number, it can be used as just a one single aggregate number. But I think it's more, it, it would be even more useful if we look at those subcategories, subsets, um, those, um, those different factors um, uh, included by um, the YMI initiative because the more factors uh, that we know, the more variables that we can have, the more that we can understand the phenomenon. Thank you, Jida. And anybody in the room wants to ask a question or comment, uh, please just indicate and put up your hand. If not, I'll, uh, I'll go over to Faith, your thoughts. Hello, okay. Um, hi everyone, so I'm Faith Lee. I'm currently a year 12 student at Chinese International School in Hong Kong and I am a representative from the Hong Kong Youth Internet Governance Forum. So um, um, I'm just gonna add on to um, the points on the slide. So first of all, I'll talk about how um, data can support advocacy and campaigns for change. So. First of all, like Wathagi said, you can tell stories through the use of data. But other than that, I think the importance of data is that we are able to deduce patterns in terms of how we as humans behave, right? So for example, um, my own experience in using data would be in a student-led campaign. So I run a student-led campaign called Justice Leaders Council where we advocate for refugee rights in the Hong Kong secondary school community. And um, so during our annual conference, um, my partner and I, we gave a presentation about um, the refugee situation in Hong Kong, which a lot of people aren't actually familiar with because in fact, Hong Kong has one of the smallest refugee populations. It only has about 10,000 refugees, but then, I think the use of data can uncover the truth behind that because after some extensive research that I did, um, I found out that only 0.6% of asylum seekers in Hong Kong were accepted as refugees. So that's, an, in comparison to the acceptance rate of refugees in, in European countries, which is which can be as high as 75%, 0.6% is an astonishingly low number. So with that kind of data, it really, um, it really provides a kind of knowledge and more background and more context for people to understand why we're advocating for this change. Um, so um, in terms of YMI, so the use of YMI data allows us to um, be aware of the competitive advantages in the three areas, education, employment, and entrepreneurship. So um, why do I think youth, mobi youth mobility is important and what is the relevance as we move towards an increasingly digital economy? So um, I think one thing that distinguishes youth from other kinds of, any other kind of individuals is that um, youth generally, they aren't afraid and they're in fact willing to accept. They're 
in fact, enthusiastic about change in their lives. So for example, um, a lot of youth nowadays, they're willing to go abroad to study, they're willing to go abroad to work, and I think nowadays it would be fair to say that um, youth is um, being brought up in increasingly um, international and global backgrounds. Like, for example, there are more people studying in international schools, participating in overseas competitions and such. And I think that nowadays, um, people and youth in particular, they're more invested in obtaining life experience rather than tangible goods. So in the past, a lot of people would be very um, fixated on trying to obtain things like housing and cars and other kinds of tangible goods, whereas nowadays we're more focused on traveling uh, or education abroad, like that kind of life experience. So I think youth mobility and having the youth mobility index in place would allow youngsters to venture into new opportunities and also give them the ability to be able to adapt to different environments and immerse themselves in cultural experiences to pursue their passions and broaden their horizons. So um, I, think, I think when, in terms of measuring the youth mobility index, I think a couple of things, the most important things that should be taken into consideration would be the backgrounds, like cultures and upbringings of the individuals that are being investigated, and that includes their education. So um, the education system differs depending on the country and also depending um, school by school. And um, so, and so in Hong Kong, there's actually two streams of schools. So there's local schools and international schools. And I think that like the education in which they grew up with can significantly influence the way they think and the way they behave in the future as well. So I think that would be a very um, important determining factor for um, youth mobility. Um, and finally, I just like to shed some light upon uh, how we can encourage governments and other stakeholders to participate, at, to participate in and to improve these um, indices. And how do we encourage governments to use YMI as a positive change, um, for positive change and as a measurement for success? And it, should, it shouldn't be just a superficial level of success that governments use on their promotional materials. Rather, it should actually advocate for policy change. And um, yeah, so um, currently, um, after attending a workshop today um, called um, um, creating, it's something along the lines of um, the future of jobs for generation Y and Z. I found out that the biggest issue is that people don't trust in young people's capacities. Um, so what I mean by that is that um, young people, they aren't provided with, um, for example, a lot of job opportunities because um, they're, being, um, they're being underestimated due to their inexperience. Um, however, um, I don't think that youth should be underestimated because um, they hold an extremely powerful voice. And one of the key characteristics I think youth possess is that they're often passionate and they're often determined. And when once a group of like-minded youth, they come together, they can bring a very significant change. And like I mentioned previously, youth, they generally aren't afraid, and they're in fact very enthusiastic about change. And they're also very enthusiastic about bringing change into society. For example, um, in the umbrella, umbrella Revolution in Hong Kong, it was actually, a lot of it was actually youth driven, and it's very, and so I think youth surprisingly have a very large amount of power that we should not be undermining. So um, to conclude, like Angel said, youth uh, were an essential part of future society. So with something like why am I in place, um, I believe that um, I believe that it'll be extremely crucial in the process of advocating for policy change. Thank you. You mentioned about the, your work actually very interesting in, in, in advocating for refugee rights uh, in Hong Kong. So you identified that data and you kind of published it or, or, or told the world about it. Has that changed anything and what's, what's, uh, what's happening to that? 0.6% versus 75% is a huge gap. Yeah, it's 
an actually very astonishing disparity. So um, obviously because um, we just started back in August and our annual conference was held in November and because because we're a student-led organization and we just started, then obviously no policy changes have been made. But then I think advocacy, even though we're only taking baby steps, advocacy, without advocacy, the policy, without advocacy, then the whole process wouldn't even be there. So we need advocacy as a head start. So actually about 100 and something people attended our annual conference. And although that might not seem like a large amount, um, with more and more students being aware of these statistics, like at least um, I think them being aware of the problem is important in order for us to bring change, yeah. Thank you. And just to try to involve the audience, if there's any questions or, or comments so far. If not, this is a good kind of segue into uh, what uh, Sherry will share further, uh, building on, on the discussion, about, um, uh, I, I wonder, um, Faith, wh how you got the data for 0.6%. For, for I guess it's some open government data, uh, or, or not? Okay, hello. Okay, so um, we, my organization, we actually worked with an NGO called Justice Center Hong Kong. So they're an NGO that provide pro bono legal assistance to refugees and asylum seekers. Um, so, and they also have a team of researchers that publish this kind of materials. So um, we do get this kind of knowledge from them. Uh, and, but then obviously um, not a lot of, because Justice Center, they're still quite small, so not a lot of people know about them. So um, we kind of advocate for Justice Center's work. So by advocating for their work and because their work also aligns with our beliefs as well. So then by advocating that way and by providing that kind of information to a wider audience and namely um, secondary school students in Hong Kong, I think that would be a good start for um, empowering change, yeah. Thank you. And, oh, there is a question. That's great. Yeah, I do. So my name is Liam Bakirsky. I'm from Toronto uh, in Canada. And actually, I'm working on a project with one of my, uh, with my university there, York University. Uh, and uh, it's a digital mobility project. Uh, and I'm just wondering in terms of the, the quality, uh, I mean, there's, so I, obviously there's, there's the, the traditional mindset, of course, is to go on exchange and, and send students abroad, but of course it's, it's a completely new, new phenomenon. In terms of the quality of experiences uh, that are being realized, I'm not sure if you're, uh, I'm just, I'm wondering just in terms of the data, does that, does it take that into account? Is it simply going on to, uh, or meeting people online? Is there, is there a measure to the quality of that experience? And then uh, in the second kind of point, is there, uh, is, is there a way, do you have, do you have a model that, that can guide kind of a quality experience uh, in terms of uh, digital mobility? Th that's a great question, actually. Um, this is something that, uh, unfortunately, Shanti, Professor Shanti couldn't join us today. Um, one of the things that we hope to inspire are, are follow-up uh, uh, studies or case studies, because sometimes if you look at the quality situation, it's more of a, a, a case study than uh, completely uh, a kind of a quantifiable or, or, or kind of a, uh, turns into a number. Uh, we, we do have, we, we, we did consider that a, a little bit and, and we're great to, to, to take, keep this offline, like take this offline, I'll definitely follow up with you. Um, uh, in terms of what we call life experience uh, um, uh, sub-index within the YMI, and we look at how uh, the quality of life in the, in the young people's mind, you know, how, uh, and, and it takes into consideration, like, not, not just health, but uh, how, how much esports is there, uh, you know, how, how much bars are there, you know, some, some of the, uh, I think the, uh, uh, how, how should I say? I think it's the 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 Richard Florida thing with the uh, with the creative class uh, components. How much is that there to attract young people? So so we didn't include a bit of it, but I think what, specifically on what you 
mentioned, it's much more uh, for we hope to inspire uh, case studies, uh, and then you can look back at you know um, look back at whether if if those areas change, does it move the 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 the, the YMI index? We hope that you know if the quality increases, it actually does move. If it doesn't, then then we need to change our methodology as well. That's uh, where hopefully answers. But that now I'll, I'll move to, to Sherry, who um, we were talking a little bit about the data that, that was uh, uh, from, from, from refugees, and it's supposed to come from government, I guess, uh, but it, it, it wasn't, and that tells us a little bit about open data that comes from government. Um, the time is running out, so how many minutes do I have? Uh, we, we started a bit late, but uh, let's run for about three, three or five minutes more. That's okay. Um, okay, so um, I'm Sherry, so I'm a fellow of U of F IGF, and I'm also working with um, ISOC Hong Kong. So we have a project of a Hong Kong Open Data Index, because currently there's no um, global index that covers Hong Kong, and so we aim to evaluate the openness of government data. So touching on the um, refugee data that um, Faith mentioned that it wasn't from the government, um, yes, because um, um, like um, the government, like Hong Kong government is very, um, I would say, um, reserved in opening up the data uh, according to the, like our conversations with the different stakeholders that we approached during the project. Um, I can share with you one example um, from a conversation with um, the land uh, research community um, in the dis uh, regarding the discussion of land data opened up by the government. So it was very interesting that um, the research community pointed out that it's actually very hard to have access to the government data because they don't really want the public to spot the um, policy problem. And so there is one example that um, the Development Bureau of Hong Kong released a report. They did a survey on regarding um, the temporary land of uh, the land of temporary uh, leasing in Hong Kong, trying to calculate the, uh, the amount of that um, land of temporary leasing in Hong Kong. But they public um, they published the report in a PDF format. So imagine like this land data, which involves uh, a lot of maps and um, like in, uh, including a lot of uh, maps and also this data of the land. They published that one in the PDF format, which really um, created a lot of obstacles for the researchers. And so um, currently there is um, this con um, um, this um, policy. Um, driven by the government to build artificial land in Hong Kong out of nowhere. That was like in the middle of the sea, they want to build them artificial land. And so this research community, by um, trying to draw the data, they couldn't have the access from the government. So they have to um, buy the maps from the government and they try to scrape from the GeoMap website from the government and try to organize and um, coordinate the data from different sources, and they create and they find out that there are actually a lot of vacant lands that can be used. So instead of having this artificial land being built to solve the housing problem in Hong Kong, there are actually a lot of lands that isn't used properly. And so this shed lights on the importance of having open data. And so should I conclude here? And so adding, um, drawing the link between uh, mobility and data, I would say that um, I would translate mobility into, um, there are, I would see mobility as geographical mobility as well as social mobility. And so I would translate social mobility into an autonomy of choosing and planning your um, lifestyle and your role in society. And so it's very important from the cases of this land data in Hong Kong, you can see that it's really important to have data access to data by the public so you can make changes and impacts to the government and drive the policy towards um, favorable, to, to a favorable um, future that you prefer in order to enhance your lifestyle. And this is how I see data and mobility. Thank you, Jerry. We see a question. Is it working? Ah, it is working. I didn't see the light. So, um, the, when the researchers found out that this artificial land project wasn't needed, uh, what, did the dialogue with the government continue? Was it because 
the government didn't realize that the landing, uh, the housing problem could be solved in another way, or they knew it and still wanted to go forward? And what, what, how did this affect the general approach of opening up government data? Um, the government has very strong motivation in pushing that artificial land policy, despite that um, there have been a lot of voices and also a lot of campaigns that are going on because of having this piece of information found out by that com uh, research community. And I can't, um, I can't really comment on if it's that the government realized that this piece of information and they still deny this or they consider that it's insufficient. Um, but I would say that, um, so this is, this piece of information found out by the research community really provides a fuller picture of resources in Hong Kong. And so it is for the public to judge whether this policy is um, appropriate or not. So, be, so being from Hong Kong and being completely biased and, and, and I would say the latter. <laughs> uh, with that. Um, can you repeat your second question, please? And how did this discovery affect the general overall approach of the government to opening up more data? Um, so um, um, right now we are doing this Open Data Index Hong Kong project. It's a, in a very beginning phase. Um, we are doing this feasibility study and trying to build a methodology framework. And we hope at last, um, for eventually, we can build an index, and that index can push the government by showing that in what categories, like in what set, uh, which data set that you aren't doing enough by having these um, facts laid out, and we can force the government, like the, uh, urge and encourage the government into opening up the data. So I would say we are um, trying to make progress. Thank you, and with that, we're running out of time, and um, uh, this will bring bring this session to a close, but this is, a, I, I, we, we hope this is another stop on the journey. Uh, we started this journey about a year ago, uh, and have had, actually, this is uh, the different places that we've had sessions like this, and we continue to plan forward uh, in, in China, in, in Hong Kong, in Canada, in, in, uh, in, in Korea, in Thailand, in Vietnam, in Taiwan, in Japan, uh, and here in France. Um, and we're, we're next stop, our next stop will be in Australia just uh, tomorrow, which I'm flying over for. Um, but I think the, the point is to, to, to think about the narrative uh, from just talking about connectivity and the internet uh, it, uh, to how the internet and what we call digital mobility is actually supporting or not supporting young people uh, and, and their development and in terms of the competitiveness of young people in the different places. So thank you for joining us and um, you, can keep, keep, uh, 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 you can keep following up with, with our work at YMI.age as well.